I'm Jeff Gore. I'm in the Department of Physics. And uh, what I thought would maybe be useful is to give kind of a very concrete manifestation of you know, how I try to implement some of these active learning ideas in my classroom. Just because sometimes when I you know, read booklets about these sorts of ideas, I, I get a sense that you know, it sounds great, but I just don't know exactly what I'm being suggested to do. And it's not that there, I don't claim to have you know, the right answer, but I think it is nice just to have some, something concrete. Uh, right, so the, the course that, I'll, uh, the, well, that I'm teaching right now, and I lectured this morning, or, or lectured, uh, is, um, is a systems biology course, which broadly is trying to understand how uh, structure or function arises at a higher level of organization from lower level parts. Doesn't really matter, but just so you have some uh, sense of the composition of the class, so, uh, majority graduate student, but with a significant minority of undergraduates, uh, spread from physics to biology, biological engineering, mathematics. So it's really quite a, uh, quite a broad uh, course in terms of background, and that's, of course, one of the challenges of teaching the class. But um, I think that's a little bit orthogonal to the question of active learning. Right. And yeah, so from my standpoint, I, I would say that um, the, there are a few things that I, I very much like implementing in, uh, in this class that, uh, that help uh, with the active learning in a variety of ways. Uh, so first, I, I do very much like uh, having pre-class reading uh, together with uh, pre-class questions. And I'll tell you kind of how, how we do that. Uh, also, I do like, be, you know, this is not necessarily active learning, but I do like at the beginning of a lecture to just tell the students what they're supposed to be getting out of the lecture, like the three big ideas. I, uh, and I think this is also good for research seminars, in my opinion. Uh, I find often I'm tempted to try to uh, construct like a mystery novel in a class, you know, where you know, I'm going guide to you know, guide the group through this complex chain of reasoning and then have a big reveal at the end. But I think that's a bad idea, because nobody actually can follow what you tried to do. So I like to just be straightforward at the beginning, tell people you know, what, what hopefully they're going to learn uh, in the next hour. Uh, I also want to say a few things about how uh, we do the concept questions uh, in uh, my class, which is that we use flashcards uh, rather than the, uh, the clickers that I think many of us use. And uh, in many ways, I think I actually prefer the flashcards. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I want to stress the importance of the, the peer instruction. Uh, all right, so uh, very concretely, uh, the syllabus has some, uh, some pre-class reading. And uh, what that means, you know, and it's required in the sense that uh, I, I ask them to uh, fill out uh, answers to three questions uh, the night before. So basically, 10 o'clock the night before via Google Forms, uh, you know, they just click the link and they you know, write their name, the answers to a few of these questions. And the idea is they're really supposed to be short answer questions. Right? So they just ty uh, type in. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I get it in the form of a spreadsheet. And, uh, and then that night at, say, 1030, I, um, I can go through the, uh, the answers. I get a sense of how the students felt about, um, about the material. Uh, and also, I can then uh, send back what I view as being kind of strong responses uh, that night. All right, so first, I think the students kind of appreciate it when their answer is chosen to you know, go, back, go out to the class. Uh, but also, I think that the fact that I'm doing some work together with them makes them you know, feel not quite as annoyed that I'm forcing them to do these pre-class questions. All right. uh, and also, uh, the, um, I always have an optional question at the end of each of these sessions, or each of these, uh, these questions, which is uh, basically, yeah, what, what did you find confusing or surprising about the reading uh, or about the last lecture? Because uh, I think that there are, it's often the case that students have a question uh, that they, uh, they're not going to ask in, in, in the context of the class. But I think that here, you know, they're clicking something, you know, they're going to be sending me something anyway, so then it's just very easy uh, for them to, uh, to say something that they, uh, that they were confused by. And indeed, uh, I'd say roughly um, one in five students uh, takes advantage of this each, uh, each session. Um, and I'm, you know, this is, I just looked at the, uh, some of the responses from the, the, last, uh, the last session, and you can see some sense of the kinds of, uh, kinds of questions that students had uh, after the reading. Uh, right. In terms of uh, in terms of how to implement uh, these uh, concept tests or concept questions, I um, I actually very much like the idea of um, having a range of different ways of answering these. Right. So the traditional well, you know, the traditional method in the field is to use the clickers, uh, and a primary advantage of that is that uh, is that you can actually collect the responses, you can display them uh, on the screen, and if you want to, you can use it for attendance or even grading, although I am generally not so excited about that. So from my standpoint, I, I actually very much like uh, these uh, flashcards 
because uh, they're very cheap. I mean, I had them made eight years ago, and you know, they're still going strong. Uh, so the students don't have to buy anything. There's never a question of them forgetting their, uh, you know, their clicker and then coming to you in the beginning of the class. Uh, also, you don't have to wrestle with any software to get something working. You know, so I find low tech is often very nice. Uh, but even, uh, even these flashcards, I find, are, e are more complex than is needed for many uh, of the questions that I like to ask in the sense that uh, if I'm going to be giving the students, say, 30 seconds or more to think about a problem before answering, then I'll, I'll use uh, the flashcards. And, and those are the questions that it's very likely that we're going to want to uh, go ahead and do the uh, peer instruction where they, the students will pair off and discuss afterwards. Uh, but I, um, in, in line with this basic idea that uh, you, know, you should use it or lose it, right, that part of the goal of a lot of the active learning uh, techniques is that we just want to give the students practice uh, doing, uh, just using uh, the material and applying it. And I, I think in some cases, it, it really is a tricky concept, right? So the classic questions that you see for a lot of, uh, a lot of these concept tests are, are they're, they're real distractors in the sense that you see these other answers and you are tempted to try to, you know, to, to say the wrong thing. Uh, whereas there are also, I think, just lower level uh, activities that you just have to practice, all right? Well, you know, if the current is going here, you know, where's the magnetic field going to be? And I think that's the kind of thing that you just want to have the students do over and over again. All right, so if when I teach uh, the freshman uh, electricity and magnetism course, for example, uh, we'll do verbal responses, like dozens and dozens of them in every session, where every time that I'm, I'm, I'm on the board and I'm about to draw the direction of the magnetic field, I will just say, you know, is the magnetic field here you know, up, you know, down, left, or right? And, I, you know, and then I wait a few seconds. I say, three, two, one. And, you know, and I, you know, eventually, it feels awkward for me. It feels awkward for them. But uh, I would say that this is the situation where just, you have to do this many, many times in order to be comfortable with it. And so I, uh, I like a lot of these uh, short, simple questions that just keep people engaged. Just give them practice, uh, even with the, uh, the lower level skills. Uh, and well, and you can also see a nice thing here is that when the flashcards go up, you can just look out and you get a quick sense of the distribution of the cards. And based on the distribution here, I would say that if, um, if you have, say, more than 85% uh, of the class getting it right, then I would typically not have uh, the students pair off. I would just say that, oh, yeah, a majority <laughs> of the group is agreeing that it's going to be C, and I might ask someone why that is or whatnot. Uh, but then if it's, uh, if it's more in the range of, say, 40 to 80% of the, the students uh, getting it right, then I, would, then I would have them pair off and go ahead and discuss it. Uh, if it's less than 40% have it right, then there's a real question of whether, you know, it might be there's, just, there's enough general confusion that you want to kind of guide the class uh, a little bit more before having them, uh, having them discuss on their own. Uh, and uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, so just a few, a few closing thoughts. Uh, right, so for me, I very much enjoy incorporating these active learning kinds of, uh, of, kinds of approaches in the classroom and that uh, I think that, uh, you know, a really a beautiful lecture is indeed a beautiful thing, but it's a beautiful thing in the way that a performance is a beautiful thing, right? That if you, uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a, let's say a tennis player, it is, it's, it's wonderful to watch a professional tennis player go and do their thing, right? Same thing if you want to go to the ballet, right? But if you want to learn to be, you know, a ballerina, you don't just watch people do the ballet. You, you go and you try it yourself. And right? so I think that part of the goal of the active learning is to, in addition to having the students see, you know, view an expert at the craft doing their thing, it's also just you want to get them, uh, get them doing it. And in the context of a classroom, it really generates a fun dynamic because there is much more back and forth. Uh, I, um, I'm very much a believer in the idea of just doing very um, kind of frequent practice of um, even these, in these easier, what you might call the easier kind of problems, just because it, keeps, it, it just keeps people engaged and they, they just get comfortable doing the lower level things so then they can uh, apply them in more, uh, more difficult situations. Uh, and uh, as was mentioned previously, I think that part of what is nice about a lot of these approaches is that it does provide this tight feedback between, uh, between the student, the instructor, uh, and the material in the sense that the, the students get a better sense of where they are, uh, the instructor gets a better sense of where the class is, and it's not always obvious. I mean, I, you, know, you can be surprised that how much confusion there is. You can be surprised at how well they know the material. And, you know, and in either case, you, you, have, you want to adjust your uh, strategy accordingly. And, and with that, we'll go on.